disaster happens, Look at the debris. Look at all the debris. Look at all the debris in the air. The financial cost of all the lives lost. Disasters to ever strike the planet. KLM 4805 is now ready for takeoff and we're waiting for our ABC clearance. Over the next hour, we'll see collisions, accidents, and incidents on trains, boats, and planes that have destroyed hundreds of thousands of lives. Trains, ships, how well we have succeeded, the colonies, the air, and the oceans. Despite major progress in the season, all of these now colonies, zero risk is not exist. The slightest error, slightest flaw in sign on it, to the most terrible tragedy. I love this. This is 10 most significant errors. We have studied the human over a dozen air crashes, shipwrecks, or train accidents. But also, we know some of these events have had around the world in the past few decades. Millions of little seekers travel to air bases around the world and marvel at the dirt of his skin to the pilots. Dazzled by the aerial apparatus of how they their heads, it's easy to forget. Please. Saturday, July 27, 2002, more than 10,000 people gathered for an annual Skin Air Show near Lviv in Western Ukraine. One of the most anticipated was the best pilot aboard a Sukhoi S-27. After several aggregate stops, Pilot the tent a maneuver called SPS. This jaw-dropping aerial combat attack maneuver demands an ultra-fast change of course. In principle, the plane launched at full speed, then the half roll and dives towards the ground. It ends up flying completely upside down, an inverted flight. That day, at a crucial moment, the two pilots lose control of their plane and were off. just enough time to eject before their 17-ton plane slams into the tarmac at 160 kilometers per hour. The speeding, out-of-control Sukhoi smashes into several planes on the ground before its fuel tank explodes. It happens so fast that spectators in its path are mowed down. Others get hit by debris from the explosion. Pilot 
which unscathed from the disaster. In the investigation that followed, they argued that the flight plan they had received before the performance wasn't realistic, and their request to revert for the ship had been denied by the organizers. Despite their pleas, they are held responsible for the crash. Skinny and Aerosol disaster was swift and real. Within seconds, a Sugoi 27 crash killed 77 spectators, including Kromi children. It is the deadliest air show accident in history. typically gather at the small driven wreckage to report the death count. But for Flight 27, they never got that opportunity. The air disaster that takes night place is left behind not a single clue. To investigate, we head to Malaysia and the Indian Ocean, where, in 2014, Malaysia Airlines Flight MH370 simply vanished. On March 8, 2014, a Boeing 777 takes off from Kuala Lumpur, capital of Malaysia. The plane is carrying 239 people. Destination, Beijing. But very quickly, something goes terribly wrong. Less than an hour after the crash, radio contact is lost. The aircraft appears to be flying erratically at a speed of 800 kilometers per hour in the opposite direction of its original flight plan. Its signal disappears from radar screens that monitor commercial flights. An hour later, it vanishes from military radar. It will never appear. In the tense hours that follow, the disappearance of Malaysia Airlines flight at range 370 moves into the national headlines. Jumbo jets don't just disappear. The world holds its breath, waiting to find out what could have happened. For the experts, there is no room for doubt. The plane crashed at sea, killing everyone on board. But in the absence of definitive evidence of the crash, some people continue to find hope. Could the plane have landed on one of the thousands of uninhabited islands in the region? On the day of the plane's disappearance, its transponders, which automatically communicate with ground radar, either failed or were inexplicably turned off. To try to reconstruct the accident scenario, investigators turned to satellites. Every hour, the plane automatically communicated with a satellite by acknowledging a logon request. Based on an analysis of this information, experts extrapolated the trajectory of MH370 after it vanished from the radar screens. They confirmed that the plane would have come south. It would then have maintained its course for six hours before exhausting the fuel and crashed into the open sea. With the little data they had, the authorities managed to find the search area of 4.6 million square kilometers equal to almost half of the surface of China. A year after the disappearance of Flight 37, part of the wing launches up the shore of the moon more than 3,000 kilometers from the search area. It's the first real proof of the plane deep and deep in the sea. Other pieces will be found later. One will be enough to allow investigators to gain a picture of the accident.
Some said she should never have been built, but even they could hardly fail to respect the achievement that's to be realized today. All that remains if this first flight is successful is to prove that supersonics can operate economically on the air routes of the world. Archie Asia, you know how to fence to examine the birds of the stars and eight years. National Flight Paris, thousands. and it helped end the career of one of the most innovative aircraft in the history of aviation. Now, up toward the skies, the white bird of tomorrow. On January 21st, 1976, air transport entered the era of supersonic flight. Brand new air crew, jointly developed by France and England, was born in 15 years of hard work and technological achievement. The Comet. Extraordinary aircraft. It was faster than the speed of sound. Its own competitor market, Russian Tupola 144, was definitively abandoned in 1977, which suffered two accidents in the space of a year. Concorde's design was cutting edge. The Boeing 747, launched in 1969, flies at an altitude of 11,500 meters. It takes just over seven hours. to connect London to New York. Concord reached to 6,000 meters and reached Mach 2, dizzying speed of 2,175 kilometers per hour. Supersonic jump and acceleration stands a band of fun just three and a half hours. For more than over 20 years, Concord killed tens of thousands of passengers Main to the forefront, aeronautical technology, but despite its enormous technological success, its future and its legacy will be doomed by a single jagged shard of metal. It is January 25, 2000. Air France Flight 4590 is Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris, destination New York. As the aircraft accelerates on the takeoff runway, it hits a small strip of metal. Lost by Continental Airlines Flight 55, a DC-10 which had just departed Paris a few minutes earlier. As the speeding Concorde strikes the metal, it punctures one of its huge tires, which explodes, spraying debris directly into the full fuel tank under the plane's wing. By this point, the jet is already traveling too fast for the pilots to cut the throttle. They're forced to continue the takeoff procedure. By the time the plane leaves the ground, flames have already reached the floor of the aircraft. The pilots immediately shut down the left engines, which had caught fire. But the right engines are not powerful enough to do it. Less than two minutes after taking, the airplane stalls, things sharply to the left, crashes on the road. It will be a moment to be taken for us. None of the passengers or crew survive. While some experts initially wonder about the possibility of pilot error or a lack of knowledge of the aircraft, the investigation will conclude that a terrible and highly improbable chain reaction triggered the disaster. Entirely due to the strip, the scrap of metal from the DC-10 fell into the worst place on the runway. And was the sole cause of the accident, leading to the inevitable outcome. Ten years after the accident, Continental Airlines was deemed responsible and ordered to pay seventy million dollars, seventy percent of the total amount of the compensation bill. The engineer who had incorrectly fixed the metal strip on the Continental aircraft was found guilty and received a fifteen-month suspended sentence. Was cancelled on appeal two years later. Overnight, British Airways made exhaustive safety checks on its fleet. Today, the airline said it had complete confidence in its Concorde service. The crash of January 25, 2000, was the only fatal accident in Concorde's 37 glorious years of operation. It cost the lives of 100 passengers and a lot of crew. As there was four people who were near the crash when the aircraft crashed. This terrible drama ended one of the most beautiful technological success stories of the 20th century.
after exploring three air crashes, we head out to sea. The tragedy and an iceberg struck an ocean liner in 1912. The disaster earning seventh place in our home is one of the most notorious of all time. It took place in the North Atlantic on a ship called the Titanic. At the start of the 20th century, the only way to reach America was to cross the Atlantic by ship. White Star Lines, a shipping company in Liverpool, England, was one of the leaders in the field. In 1912, it announced the completion of the Titanic, the biggest ship ever built at the time. Stretching 269 meters, the ship with the length of three football fields weighed more than 50,000 tons. The Titanic was designed to carry 2,500 passengers and 900 crew members. For those who could afford first class, it was the definition of luxury. Everything about the ship grabbed headlines, including the claim that it was unsinkable. On April 10th, 1912, the Titanic left Southampton on her way forge, destination where you were. It embarked with 2,224 passengers and crew members, only two-thirds of its rated capacity. The first three days of the trip go smoothly. The sea is calm. The speed is steady. Contrary to some rumors, there was no attempt to break speed records for this first crossing. On April 14th, the ship approaches the icy waters of the North Atlantic. The commander receives the first alerts of icebergs. But at the time, advances in shipbuilding made it seem like ice no longer posed a serious threat to the hulls of such gigantic ships. This was the dawn of a new modern era. The Titanic continued full steam ahead through a clear and cloudless night. At 11.40 p.m., one of the spotted a huge iceberg straight ahead and unfortunately more close. Following emergency procedures, the captain immediately puts the engines in full reverse and tries to change the course pulling the rudder to starboard. But it's too late. 37 seconds later, the side of the ship strikes the 75 million iceberg. Buckles, but isn't pierced. Still, the shock blows out the rivets of the water. Six previously watertight walls begin to flood. The Titanic is still flooded with four flood targets. The ship is doomed. Twenty minutes later, the captain gives the order to abandon the ship. As the Titanic begins to sink, bowed first into the icy water, women and children put on life boats. So, the possible rock boats are enough to carry 4,000 people. Before this first crossing, only 20 were on board. Not to hold roughly 1,000 people. Swipes. Groups burn from with only half fill the available boats. Then more passengers to certain men. At 2.18 a.m., with all the lifeboats in the water, the bow of the night Titanic sinks into the ocean. Forward areas are so flooded that the stern is lifted in the air. Pressure on the hull is so thick the ship breaks in two, sinking into the Atlantic. The largest ocean liner in the world, supposedly unsinkable, has just disappeared. For most of those not on lifeboats, death comes quickly. The water, just above freezing, would have caused cardiac arrest, shock, and drowning. The sinking of the supposedly unsinkable Titanic still captures the public's imagination after more than a century, and the search for it never stopped. The wreckage was finally located in 1985, 
viewpoint is familiar. Today, the wreck is a UNESCO World Heritage Site and will remain as it is until its once magnificent skeleton decomposes. Of the 2,224 people who were on board that fateful night of April 15, 1912, only 710 managed to board the lifeboats and survive. The sinking of the Titanic proved 1,514 lives and will forever remain one of the most significant traumas in the history of navigation. Disaster occurred in Marmon Valley, France, in 1917. A single 1917, the first world war ended since the year. Life is an incredible The troops are exhausted by the and the sense of freedom. France is undoubtedly the country that's suffering the obvious cost of the war. Troop morale is plummeting. General Emile Fayol, commander in chief of the French forces in Italy, offers two weeks of rest to the soldiers of two of his divisions. On the night of December 10th, the Italian military the city of in northern Italy, bound for Chambly in eastern France, on board nearly a thousand soldiers. After crossing the Alps through Monsignor's tunnel, the train arrives at Modane Station, where it stops for an hour to let other planes pass. A 350 meters long and weighing over 500 tons, the train is huge, slow, and very unwieldy. Only three of its 19 cars are equipped with compressed air brakes. The others have manual braking systems and seven operators on board to operate them. Such a heavy train should have been hauled by two locomotives, but the second had been requisitioned for the war. 1115 p.m., the train leaves the its journey towards the valley. As it travels, the tracks begin to slow, and the train, propelled by its enormous weight, starts picking up speed. Normally, the moon to 40 kilometers per hour. The sea exceeds in painting. The brakes aren't powerful enough to slow it. The runaway train races down the tracks at the dizzying speed of 135 kilometers per hour. 13 hundred meters before arriving at San Michel or Mingalong Station. 19 wagons in the air. Smash against the valley walls along the tracks. Through the brakes, and the ammunition used by the soldiers bind to turn the cloud into inferno. It is a crash site from hell. Rescue teams are forced to wait until the next day for the fire to be under control before they can discover the extent of the disaster. Eventually, they recover 424 identifiable bodies from the wreckage. 135 other victims are too badly burned to ever be identified. A further 37 will be found scattered along the tracks. More than 100 other victims will ultimately succumb to their injuries. The official report will list 675 dead, but some experts believe that the true figure is closer to 800. They had survived the worst of the war only to be killed on their way home for a rest. Only 183 lived. More than 100 years later, the derailment remains the worst rail accident in history.
we return to the spot to go visit the disaster that takes the fifth phase of our ranking. The deadliest air crash in history, which happened in Japan. June 2nd, 1971, a Japan Airlines Flight 115, Boeing 747, was involved in an incident at Itami Airport in Osaka. The tail struck the tarmac during landing and caused major damage to the fuselage. The aircraft was sent for repair and all seemed well. Fortunately, the repair was inadequate and the consequences were deadly. More than seven years after the incident at the Tommy Airport, on August 2, 1985, the same Japan Airlines plane, under the class sign Japan 123, departs from Haneda Airport in Tokyo. Destination? It carries 509 passengers and 15 crew. The aircraft takes off and climbs smoothly to its cruising altitude, 10,000 meters. Its speed reaches about 885 kilometers per hour, but barely 12 minutes after takeoff, the plane suffers a sudden impact. I found it! I found it! Badly repaired seven years earlier, has just uh, given way. Okay, sorry, uh, I'm sorry, 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 the pilots contact the control tower where they will attempt an emergency landing. But here's a problem. The plane is flying erratically, and despite our attempts, the pilots can no longer control it. The aircraft banks to the right as the pilot correct, and it refuses to gain altitude. Confusion reigned in the country. Nobody yet realizes that the rocket hull has destroyed the plane's horizontal controls and severed all four hydraulic lines that hold flaps which pull vertical movement. In the cabin, the captain and his crew muster every available resource to try to regain control of the plane. The captain manages with each star to stabilize its trajectory by modulating the thrust of its engines. But each time they achieved stability, it would last only a few moments. For 32 minutes of this heroic fight against this totally body control plane, the pilots lose their battle. At 6.56 p.m., the plane bends violently to the fire and goes towards the south for Takam Kahalamuti. It crashes at an altitude of approximately 1,565 meters. Believing that no one could survive such an accident, the emergency services don't go to the site until the next morning. On arrival, they find a scene of almost total devastation. And yet, the rescuers will discover four surviving passengers. Experts now estimate that more than 50 people may have survived the initial impact, but succumbed to their injuries or hypothermia overnight. On site, dozens of farewell notes written by the victims moments before impact will be found. They remain a chilling testimony to the 32 minutes of terror experienced by the passengers of Japan Airlines Flight 123. A shrine has since been erected on the ridge where the plane crashed. It commemorates the lives of the 505 passengers and 15 crew members who perished on August 12, 1985. It's a poignant reminder that the victims of disasters are people not just statistics.
the disaster that takes fourth place in our catastrophic wake demonstrates the extent to which improbable coincidences can trigger the most terrible accidents. This is a train run on that unfolded on the entire near the city of Ufa, located in western Russia. The Kwebyshev railway line connects the city of Novosibirsk in Siberia all the way to the Black Sea. An epic journey of over 4,000 kilometers. Every year, thousands of people board the train to travel with their families to the west side of the country to enjoy the sunny seaside resorts of the Black Sea coast. On June 4, 1989, around 1.15 a.m., Two patched trains carrying more than 1,300 happy passengers crossed on parallel tracks halfway through their journey, about 75 kilometers east of the city of Ufa. At the precise moment of the pass, a sudden, massive explosion shatters the life. Both trains are reduced to nothing. When the rescuers arrive at the scene by helicopter, they discover a site of complete devastation. Uprooted trees, train cars scattered everywhere around the crash site, fire, and most tragically, bodies. Investigators quickly identify the cause of the explosion. 900 meters from the tracks lay a gas pipeline. Before the train passed, a leak had released propane and butane into the atmosphere. At the same time, still weather conditions did not allow the gas to dissipate. On the contrary, the highly flammable cloud grew above the ground and around the railway tracks. As the two trains drew near and were about to pass each other, they applied their brakes as a safety measure. Ironically, that simple precaution spelled their doom. One of the wheels created a simple spark, and that's all it took to trigger the explosion of the gas cloud. Experts estimated that the power of the blast was equivalent to at least 250 tons of TNT, 30 times more powerful than the most powerful non-nuclear weapon in the U.S. military. Hundreds of travelers perished in the accident. The bodies of some victims were vaporized by the intense heat and shock waves. The rescue teams will find dazed survivors still stumbling around, their clothes and flesh on fire. Others were delirious from shock and head trauma. Hundreds of victims were children returning from school trips or vacations. Entire families were wiped out. Officially, the reported toll of the dead was 575, including 181 children. But many bodies will never be found. The more likely fatality figure is probably closer to 800 victims out of the 1,300 vacation passengers traveling on the two trains that night of June 4th, 1989. This unfortunate tragedy remains the deadliest train accident in Russian history. To investigate the event that takes third place we'll need to travel back in time several hundred years to the end of the 16th century. It's a time when one of the worst maritime disasters in history took place. It helped change the world. The year is 1588, and the Spanish fleet, the so-called Invincible Armada, is on its way to invade England. At this time, Europe is divided. Protestant England and Catholic Spain have been at war for years. In 1587, on the orders of Elizabeth I of England, the English executed Mary Stuart, Queen of Scotland, an ally of Spain and its King Philip II. 
it was Philip who had long sought to reconquer the Kingdom of England. To launch his invasion, he decided in May 1588 to bring together a fleet of 150 ships and more than 30,000 men. His objective? To sail from Lisbon to the Netherlands and muster a fighting force strong enough to successfully invade England and bring the country back to Catholicism. The Armada reached Calais on August 7, 1588, to gather soldiers from the Dutch army, who were under Spanish rule at the time. But it didn't work out that way. The ships were attacked by English forces during the Battle of Broadway. Confronted by the powerful English navy and suffering significant losses, and weaker close of friends and parts, three fleet decides to abandon. The toll of losses varies according to the sources, but it is estimated that only about half of the ships of the supposedly invincible armada make it back to Spain, and nearly 20,000 sailors perished during the journey. But history will remember that bad weather and raging seas combined with the bravery of English sailors that England had put an end to the colonial ambitions of the King of Spain. Let's head now to the disaster which takes the second place in our ranking. It occurred in 1977 at the airport of Tenerife, an island in the Spanish archipelago of the Canaries off the coast of Morocco. It all started on March 27, 1977, with the sudden explosion of a small bomb at the airport on the neighboring island of Gran Canaria, where the city of Las Palmas, the capital of the archipelago, is located. They divert all flights to Los Rodeos Airport on the neighboring island of Tenerife. But Los Rodeos Airport is much smaller than its neighbor. With just a single runway and no ground detection radar, Los Rodeos is ill-equipped to handle Las Palmas air traffic. Even so, dozens of flights scheduled to land in Gran Canaria are diverted there including five airliners. Two of them are Boeing 747s, KLM Flight 4805 from Amsterdam, and Pan Am Flight 1736 from Los Angeles. Jacob Feldhuizen van Zanten, the highly experienced captain of the KLM flight, begins refueling his plane at the end of the runway while waiting for clearance to take off again. Around 5 p.m., the refueling is over. Authorities announced the end of the incident and the reopening of the Red Maria Airport. KLM Flight 485 is Meanwhile, Pan Am Flight 1736 is instructed to slowly taxi down the single runway to exit number 3 to wait until it safely join the queue of planes ready to depart. The planes are in place and everything seems normal. Los Rodeos Airport is located 643 meters above sea level, one of the highest in Europe. And that day, 
fog will reduce visibility to barely 100 meters. Impossible for the personnel in the control tower to observe the movement of the two planes. As the KLM crew perform their final checks for takeoff, Pan Am flight slowly makes its way down the runway. It was then that a simple communication effort between the control tower and the captain of KLM flight leads to disaster. KLM 4805 is now ready for takeoff and we are waiting for our ADC clearance. The captain announces that he is ready for takeoff. KLM 8705, uh, you're cleared to pop a beacon. Flight to maintain flight level 90. In response, the tower tells him the route he's allowed to take after his ascent. It's this okay from the tower that creates confusion. To the pilot of the KLM flight, the OK indicates that he has received clearance to take off. For the controller, it means the plane is still awaiting that order from the tower. Tower responds immediately. Except that the KLM flight doesn't hear the tower's response. And at the same moment, the Pan Am flight has just missed its intended exit due to the fog. It immediately informs the control tower that it is still on the runway. No. Uh, we're still passing down the runway. 1736. But things continue to go wrong. This exchange between the patrol tower and the captain of Pan Am Flight 1736 was distorted on the radio by a shrill noise, causing confusion among the members of the KLM flight crew. In the recordings, we clearly hear that one of the co-pilots asks his captain if he is sure that the Pan Am flight has indeed left the runway. Sure of his position, Jacob Belkoisen Van Zanten disregards his co-pilot's doubts and commences to take off. By the time the Pan Am crew sees the enormous Boeing 747 hurtling towards them at more than 240 kilometers per hour, it's already too late. Get out of here. Get the hell out of here. Yes. There he is. Look at him. He's coming. Get off. Get off. Get off. The Pan Am pilot tries to swing to the left as quickly as possible. The KLM pilot, realizing his mistake, pulls on the stick to get his plane airborne immediately. The KLM nose wheel just grazes the power, but its engines destroy the upper deck and tear half the fuselage. The KLM Boeing will fly only for a few seconds before crashing to the ground and exploding only a few hundred meters away. All 248 passengers and crew members of KLM Flight 4805 are killed instantly. 335 passengers and crew members aboard Pan Am Flight 1736 will die, either on impact or in the subsequent explosion and fire. Remarkably, 61 passengers and crew members will survive the disaster and walk away. The final death toll was 583 all killed by a sequence of unfortunate events. KLM accepted full responsibility for the accident. The company paid $110 million in compensation to the victims, the equivalent of half a billion dollars today. The Tenerife collision between the two Boeing 747 aircrafts is still the deadliest air accident in history. Oh 
After studying these railroad and air accidents that claimed hundreds of victims, we may have explored the disaster that takes the first place in our ranking. It occurred at sea in 1987 in the Philippines. But it started at a shipyard in the city of Onomichi in Japan in 1963. This is where a ship called the Hemiyuru Maru was built. A ferry with a capacity of 608 passengers. Twelve years later, it was sold to the Philippine ferry operator Sulpicio Lines, and renamed Don Sulpicio. Its capacity was then updated and increased to 1,424 passengers. In 1979, the ship sank. It was rehabilitated and renamed Doña Paz. Twice a week for eight years, the Doña Paz made the crossing between Manila, the capital of the Philippines, and the city of Tacloban, on the island of Leyte, passing through the Tablas Strait, a journey of about 22 hours. On December 20th, 1987, the packed ferry leaves Tacloban at 6.30 a.m., with hundreds of Filipinos on board eager to return home for Christmas. But around 10.30 p.m., the night is clear and the sea is calm, and most of the passengers are asleep. The ferry collides with another ship and catches fire. Hannah grips the passengers. Hundreds of terrified people run through the halls looking for the reality. Those who manage to reach the ship's decks discover an apocalyptic scene. Jenny Bass has just collided with an oil tank, Vector. Carrying bonded 1,000 times on the Hilton Fed train. The impact of its tanks started huge fires on the ships. Even the seas burned slowly. Jenny has some real life boats. The life jackets. Seeing the old machines and death scenes. Passengers have no choice to kill themselves in the corner, sharpen these devices, and hope for the best. Hope is a short call that home. For two hours after the collision, the past sinks to the bottom of the street. Rockford joins it two hours later. Only 26 people are rescued by the crew of the Don Claudio, the passing ship that witnessed the explosion. The vessel managed to reach the site less than an hour after the disaster. It will take 16 hours for the official rescue services to arrive on the scene. Too late to help anyone. Of the 1,493 official passengers passed, only 24 survived, along with two of the 12 crewmen of the Vector. The day after the tragedy, the survivors report to the authorities that the ferry was carrying many more people than the ship's manifest indicated. Of the 24 passengers who had survived the Inferno, only five were on the official passenger list. The first session had the vice president of the ferry company deny that the ship was overloaded when it sank after a collision with a tanker. Nine days after the disaster, on December 29, 1987, the Philippine Daily Inquirer published a list of all those who were not in the manifest were reported by the families be on the ferry or official missing. It will take three full pages to list the names of the victims, reaching the dramatic figure of 4,375 dead. That night, the ship was carrying three times more people than authorized. Hi! Hi! Adding the 11 crew members of the vector, the death toll soars to 386 victims. Despite the overcrowding and lack of security measures, Sulpicio lines were revealed in long doing. Small bit of the tragedy will be entirely attributed to the vector. The tanker was not without a license deemed unfit for navigation. Did not have a suitably qualified marine captain on board. At the time of the collision, the Pontus sailor was in charge of surveillance on the deck. 
rest of the crew is on the watching television. The gross act of negligence and inexperience triggered the deadliest shipwreck in history. Disasters as dramatic as those we are not have missed. Never happen. <laughs> 